Book Three, Chapter Seventeen, of Robert Falconer by George Macdonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George Macdonald, Chapter Seventeen, In the Country. The next morning, Falconer, who knew the country, took us out for a drive. We passed through lanes and gates out upon an open moor where he stopped the carriage and led us a few yards on one side. Suddenly, hundreds of feet below us, down what seemed an almost precipitous descent, we saw the wood-embossomed, stream-trodden valley we had left the day before. Enough had been cleft and scooped seawards out of the lofty tableland to give room for a few little conical hills with curious peaks of bare rock. At the bases of these hills flowed noisily two or three streams, which joined in one, and trotted out to sea over rocks and stones. The hills and the sides of the great cleft were half of them green with grass, and half of them robed in the autumnal foliage of thick woods. By the streams and in the woods nestled pretty houses, and away at the mouth of the valley and the stream lay the village. All around, on our level, stretched farm and moorland. When Andrew Falconer stood so unexpectedly on the verge of the steep descent, he trembled and started back with fright. His son made him sit down a little way off, where yet we could see into the valley. The sun was hot, the air clear and mild, and the sea broke its blue floor into innumerable sparkles of radiance. We sat for a while in silence. "'Are you sure,' I said, in the hope of setting my friend talking, "'that there is no horrid pool down there, no half-trampled thicket, with broken pottery and shreds of tin dying about?' no dead carcass or dirty cottage with miserable wife and greedy children when i was a child i knew a lovely place that i could not half enjoy because although hidden from my view an ugly stagnation half mud half water lay in a certain spot below me when i had to pass it i used to creep by with a kind of dull terror mingled with hopeless disgust and i have never got over the feeling you remind me much of a friend of mine of whom i have spoken to you before said falconer eric ericson i have shown you many of his verses but i don't think i ever showed you one little poem containing an expression of the same feeling i think i can repeat it some men there are who cannot spare a single tear until they feel the last cold pressure and the heel is stamped upon the outmost layer and waking some will sigh to think the clouds have borrowed winter's wing sad winter when the grasses spring no more about the fountain's brink and some would call me coward fool i lay a claim to better blood but yet a heap of idle mud hath power to make me sorrowful i sat thinking over the verses for i found the feeling a little difficult to follow although the last stanza was plain enough falconer resumed i think this is as likely as any place he said to be free of such physical blots for the moral i cannot say but i have learned i hope not to be too fastidious i mean so as to be unjust to the whole because of the part the impression made by a whole is just as true as the result of an analysis and is greater and more valuable in every respect if we rejoice in the beauty of the whole the other is sufficiently forgotten for moral ugliness it ceases to distress in proportion as we labor to remove it and regard it in its true relations to all that surrounds it there is an old legend which i dare say you know the saviour and his disciples were walking along the way when they came upon a dead dog the disciples did not conceal their disgust the saviour said how white its teeth are that is very beautiful i rejoined thank god for that it is true whether invented or not but i added it does not quite answer to the question about which we have been talking the lord got rid of the pain of the ugliness by finding the beautiful in it it does correspond however i think in principle returned falconer only it goes much farther making the exceptional beauty hallow the general ugliness which is the true way for beauty is life and therefore infinitely deeper and more powerful than ugliness which is death a dram of sweet says spencer is worth a pound of sour it was so delightful to hear him talk for what he said was not only far finer than my record of it but the whole man spoke as well as his mouth that i sought to start him again 
I wish, I said, that I could see things as you do, in great masses of harmonious unity. I am only able to see a truth sparkling here and there, and to try to lay hold of it. When I aim at more, I am like Noah's dove, without a place to rest the sole of my foot. That is the only way to begin. Leave the large vision to itself, and look well after your sparkles. You will find them grow and gather and unite, until you are afloat on a sea of radiance, with cloud shadows, no doubt. And yet, I resumed, I never seem to have room. That is just why. But I feel that I cannot find it. I know that if I fly to that bounding cape on the far horizon there, I shall only find a place, a place to want another in. There is no fortunate island out on that sea. I fancy, said Falconer, that until a man loves space, he will never be at peace in a place. At least so I have found it. I am content if you but give me room. All space to me throbs with being in life, and the loveliest spot on the earth seems but the compression of space till the meaning shines out of it, as the fire flies out of the air when you drive it close together. To seek place after place for freedom is a constant effort to flee from space, and a vain one, for you are ever haunted by the need of it, and therefore when you seek most to escape it, fancy that you love it and want it. You are getting too mystical for me now, I said. I am not able to follow you. I fear I was on the point of losing myself. At all events, I can go no further now, and indeed I fear I have been but skirting the limbo of vanities. He rose, for we could both see that this talk was not in the least interesting to our companion. We got again into the carriage, which, by Falconer's orders, was turned and driven in the opposite direction still at no great distance from the lofty edge of the heights that rose above the shore we came at length to a lane bounded with stone walls every stone of which had its moss and every chink its fern the lane grew more and more grassy the walls vanished and the track faded away into a narrow winding valley formed by the many meeting curves of opposing hills they were green to the top with sheep grass and spotted here and there with patches of fern great stones and tall withered foxgloves the air was sweet and beautiful and andrew evidently enjoyed it because it reminded him again of his boyhood the only sound we heard was the tinkle of a few tender sheep bells and now and then the tremulous bleating of a sheep with a gentle winding the valley led us into a more open portion of itself where the old man paused with a look of astonished pleasure. Before us, seaward, rose a rampart against the sky, like the turreted and embattled wall of a huge eastern city, built of loose stones piled high and divided by great peaky rocks. In the center rose above them all one solitary, curiously shaped mass, one of the oddest peaks of the Himalayas in miniature. From its top on the further side was a sheer descent to the waters far below the level of the valley from which it immediately rose. It was altogether a strange, freaky, fantastic place, not without its grandeur. It looked like the remains of a frolic of the titans, or rather, as if reared by the boys and girls while their fathers and mothers lay stretched out huge in length, and in breath, too, upon the slopes around and laughed thunderously at the sportive invention of their sons and daughters. Falconer helped his father up to the edge of the rampart that he might look over. Again he started back, afraid of that which was high, for the lowly valley was yet at a great height above the diminished waves. On the outside of the rampart ran a narrow path whence the green hillside went down steep to the sea. The gulls were screaming far below us. We could see the little flying streaks of white, Beyond was the great ocean. A murmured sound came up from its shore. We descended and seated ourselves on the short, springy grass of a little mound at the foot of one of the hills, where it sank slowly like the dying gush of a wave into the hollowest center of the little vale. Everything tends to the cone shaped here, said Falconer, the oddest and at the same time most wonderful of mathematical figures. Is it not strange, I said, that oddity and wonder should come so near? They often do in the human world as well, returned he. Therefore it is not strange that Shelley should have been so fond of this place. 
It is told of him that repeated sketches of this spot were found on the covers of his letters. I know nothing more like Shelley's poetry than this valley, wild, fantastic, and yet beautiful, as if a huge genius were playing at grandeur and producing little models of great things. But there is one grand thing I want to show you a little further on. We rose and walked out of the valleys on the other side along the lofty coast. When we reached a certain point, Falconer stood and requested us to look as far as we could along the cliffs to the face of the last of them. "'What do you see?' he asked. "'A perpendicular rock, going right down into the blue waters,' I answered. "'Look at it. What is the outline of it like? Whose face is it?' "'Shakespeare's, by all that is grand,' I cried. "'So it is,' said Andrew. "'Right. Now I'll tell you what I would do. If I were very rich and there were no poor people in the country, I would give a commission to some great sculptor to attack that rock and work out its suggestion. Then, if I had any money left, we should find one for Bacon and one for Chaucer and one for Milton, and as we are about it, we may fancy as many more as we like, so that from the bounding rocks of our island the memorial faces of our great brothers should look abroad over the seas into the infinite sky beyond. Well, now, said the elder, I think it is grander as it is. You are quite right, father, said Robert. And so with many of our fancies for perfecting God's mighty sketches, which he only can finish. Again we seated ourselves and looked out over the waves. I have never yet heard, I said, how you managed with that poor girl that wanted to drown herself, on Westminster Bridge, I mean, that night, you remember. Miss St. John has got her in her own house at present. She has given her those two children we picked up at the door of the public house to take care of, poor little darlings they are bringing back the life in her heart already there is actually a little colour in her cheek the dawn i trust of the eternal life that is miss st john's way as often as she gets hold of a poor hopeless woman she gives her a motherless child it is wonderful what the childless woman and the motherless child do for each other i was much amused the other day with the lecture one of the police magistrates gave a poor creature who was brought before him for attempting to drown herself. He did give her a sovereign out of the poor box, though. Well, that might just tide her over the shoal of self-destruction, said Falconer, but I cannot help doubting whether anyone has a right to prevent a suicide from carrying out his purpose, who is not prepared to do a good deal more for him than that. What would you think of the man who snatched the loaf from a hungry thief, threw it back into the baker's cart and walked away to his club dinner harsh words of rebuke and the threat of severe punishment upon a second attempt what are they to the wretch weary of life to some of them the kindest punishment would be to hang them for it it is something else than punishment that they need if the comfortable alderman had but a feeling of their afflictions felt in himself for a moment how miserable he must be what a waste of despair must be in his heart before he would do it himself before the awful river would appear to him a refuge from the upper air, he would change his tone. I fear he regards suicide chiefly as a burglarious entrance into the premises of the respectable firm of Venison Port and Company. But you mustn't be too hard upon him, Falconer, for if his god is his belly, how can he regard suicide as other than the most awful sacrilege? Of course not. His well-fed divinity gives him one great commandment. Thou shalt love thyself with all thy heart. The great breach is to hurt thyself. Worst of all, to send thyself away from the land of luncheons and dinners to the country of thought and vision. But alas, he does not reflect on the fact that the good Belial does not feed all his votaries, that he has his elect, that the altar of his inner table too often smokes with no sacrifice, of which his poor meagre priest may partake they must uphold the divinity which has been good to them and not suffer his worship to fall into disrepute really robert said his father i am afraid to think what you will come to you will end in denying there is a god at all you don't believe in hell and now you justify suicide really i must say to say the least of it i have not been accustomed to hear such things the poor old man looked feebly righteous at his wicked son. I verily believe he was concerned for his eternal fate. 
Falconer gave a pleased glance at me, and for a moment said nothing. Then he began, with a kind of logical composure, "'In the first place, Father, I do not believe in such a God as some people say they believe in. Their God is but an idol of the heathen, modified with a few Christian qualities. For hell, I don't believe there is any escape from it but by leaving hellish things behind. For suicide, I do not believe it is wicked, because it hurts yourself, but I do believe it is very wicked.' I only want to put it on its own right footing. And pray, what do you consider its right footing? My dear father, I recognize no duty as owing to a man's self. There is and can be no such thing. I am and can be under no obligation to myself. The whole thing is a fiction and of evil invention. It comes from the upper circles of the hell of selfishness, or perhaps it may with some be merely a form of metaphysical mistake, but an untruth it is then for the duty we do owe to other people how can we expect the men or women who have found life to end as it seems to them in a dunghill of misery how can we expect such to understand any obligation to live for the sake of the general others to no individual of whom possibly do they bear an endurable relation what remains the grandest noblest duty from which all other duty springs the duty to the possible god Mind I say possible, God, for I judge it the first of my duties towards my neighbor to regard his duty from his position, not from mine. But, said I, how would you bring that duty to bear on the mind of a suicide? I think some of the tempted could understand it, though I fear not one of those could who judge them hardly and talk sententiously of the wrong done to a society which has done next to nothing for him by the poor, starved, refused husband tortured wretch perhaps who hurries at last to the night of the filthy flowing river which the one thread of hope in the web of despair crawls through the city of death what should i say to him i should say god liveth thou art not thine own but his bear thy hunger thy horror in his name i in his name will help thee out of them as i may to go before he calleth thee is to say thou forgettest unto him who numbereth the hairs of thy head stand out in the cold and the sleet and the hail of this world o son of man till thy father open the door and call thee yea even if thou knowest him not stand and wait lest there should be after all such a loving and tender one who for the sake of a good with which thou wilt be all content and without which thou never couldst be content permits thee there to stand for a time long to his sympathizing as well as to thy suffering heart here falconer paused and when he spoke again it was from the ordinary level of conversation indeed i fancy that he was a little uncomfortable at the excitement into which his feelings had borne him not many of them could understand this i dare say but i think most of them could feel it without understanding it certainly the belly with good cape on lined will neither understand nor feel it suicide is a sin against god i repeat not a crime over which human laws have any hold in regard to such man has a duty alone that namely of making it possible for every man to live and where the dread of death is not sufficient to deter what can the threat of punishment do or what great thing is gained if it should succeed what agonies a man must have gone through in whom neither the horror of falling into such a river nor the knife in the flesh instinct with life can extinguish the vague longing to wrap up his weariness in an endless sleep but i remarked you would i fear encourage the trade in suicide your kindness would be terribly abused what would you do with the pretended suicides whip them for trifling with and trading upon the feelings of their kind then you would drive them to suicide in earnest then they might be worth something which they were not before we are a great deal too humane for that nowadays i fear we don't like hurting people no we are infested with a philanthropy which is the offspring of our mammon worship but surely our tender mercies are cruel we don't like to hang people however unfit they may be to live amongst their fellows a weakling pity will petition for the life of the worst murderer but for what to keep him alive in a confinement as like their notion of hell as they dare to make it namely a place whence all the sweet visitings of the grace of god are withdrawn and the man has not a chance so to speak of growing better in this hell of theirs they will even pamper his beastly body 
they have the chaplain to visit them. I pity the chaplain, cut off in his labors from all the aids which God's world alone can give for the teachings of these men. Human beings have not the right to inflict such cruel punishment upon their fellow man. It springs from a cowardly shrinking from responsibility, and from mistrust of the mercy of God, perhaps, first of all, from an overvaluing of the mere life of the body. Hanging is tenderness itself to such a punishment. I think you are hardly fair, though, Falconer. It is the fear of sending them to hell that prevents them from hanging them. Yes, you are right, I dare say. They are not of David's mind, who would rather fall in the hands of God than of men. They think their hell is not so hard as his, and may be better for them. But I must not, as you say, forget that they do believe their everlasting fate hangs upon their hands, for if God once gets his hold of them by death, they are lost forever. But the chaplain may awake them to a sense of their sins. I do not think it is likely that talk will do what the discipline of life has not done. It seems to me, on the contrary, that the clergyman has no commission to rouse people to a sense of their sins. That is not his work. He is far more likely to harden them by any attempt in that direction. Every man does feel his sins, though he often does not know it. To turn his attention away from what he does feel by trying to rouse in him feelings which are impossible to him in the present condition is to do him a great wrong. The clergyman has the message of salvation, not of sin, to give. Whatever oppression is on a man, whatever trouble, whatever conscious something that comes between him and the blessedness of life is his sin. For whatever is not of faith is sin, and from all this he came to save us. Salvation alone can rouse in us a sense of our sinfulness. One must have got on a good way before he can be sorry for his sins. There is no condition of sorrow laid down as necessary to forgiveness. Repentance does not mean sorrow. It means turning away from the sins. Every man can do that, more or less, and that every man must do. The sorrow will come afterwards, all in good time. Jesus offers to take us out of our own hands into his, if we will only obey him. The eyes of the old man were fixed on his son as he spoke. He did seem to be thinking. I could almost fancy that a glimmer of something like hope shone in his eyes. It was time to go home, and we were nearly silent all the way. The next morning was so wet that we could not go out and had to amuse ourselves as we best might indoors. But Falconer's resources never failed. He gave us this day story after story about the poor people he had known. I could see that his object was often to get some truth into his father's mind without exposing it to rejection by addressing it directly to himself, and few subjects could be more fitted for affording such opportunity than his experiences among the poor. The afternoon was still rainy and misty. In the evening I sought to lead the conversation towards the gospel story, and then Falconer talked as I never heard him talk before. No little circumstance in the narratives appeared to have escaped him. He had thought about everything, as it seemed to me. He had looked under the surface everywhere, and found truth, minds of it, under all the upper soil of the story. The deeper he dug, the richer seemed the ore. This was combined with the most pictorial apprehension of every outward event, which he treated as if it had been described to him by the lips of an eye-witness. The whole thing lived in his words and thoughts. When anything looks strange, you must look the deeper, he would say. At the close of one of our fits of talk, he rose and went to the window. Come here, he said, after looking for a moment. All day a drooping cloud had filled the space below, so that the hills on the opposite side of the valley were hidden, and the whole of the sea near as it was. But when we went to the window, we found that a great change had silently taken place. The mist continued to veil the sky, and it clung to the tops of the hills. But like the rising curtain of a stage, it had rolled halfway up from their bases, revealing a great part of the sea and shore, and half of a cliff on the opposite side of the valley. This, in itself of a deep red, was now smitten by the rays of the setting sun, and glowed over the waters a splendor of carmine. As we gazed, the vaporous curtain sank upon the shore, and the sun sank under the waves, and the sad gray evening closed in the weeping night, and clouds and darkness swathed the weary earth. For doubtless the earth needs its night as well as the creatures that live thereon. 
In the morning the rain had ceased, but the clouds remained. But they were high in the heavens now, like a departing sorrow, revealed the outline and form which had appeared before as an enveloping vapor of universal and shapeless evil. The mist was now far enough off to be seen and thought about. It was clouds now, no longer mist and rain, and I thought how at length the evils of the world would float away, and we should see what it was that made it so hard for us to believe and be at peace. In the afternoon the sky had partially cleared, but clouds hid the sun as he sank towards the west. We walked out. A cold autumnal wind blew, not only from the twilight of the dying day, but from the twilight of the dying season. A sorrowful, hopeless wind, it seemed, full of the odors of dead leaves, those memories of green woods and of damp earth, the bare graves of the flowers. Would the summer ever come again? We were pacing in silence along a terraced walk, which overhung the shore far below. More here than from the hilltop we seemed to look immediately into space, not even a parapet intervening betwixt us and the ocean. The sound of a mournful lyric, never yet sung, was in my brain. It drew nearer to my mental grasp, but ere it alighted its wings were gone, and it fell dead on my consciousness. Its meaning was this, Welcome, requiem of nature. Let me share in thy requiescat. Blow, wind of mournful memories, let us moan together, no one taketh from us the joy of our sorrow we may mourn as we will but while i brooded thus behold a wonder the mass about the sinking sun broke up and drifted away in cloudy bergs as if scattered on the diverging currents of solar radiance that burst from the gates of the west and streamed east and north and south over the heavens and over the sea to the north these masses built a cloudy bridge across the sky from horizon to horizon and beneath it shone the rosy-sailed ships floating stately through their triumphal arch up the channel to their home. Other clouds floated stately, too, in the upper sea over our heads, with dense forms thinning into vaporous edges. Some were of a dull angry red, some of as exquisite a primrose hue as ever the flower itself bore on its bosom, and betwixt their edges beamed out the sweetest, purest, most melting, most transparent blue, the heavenly blue, which is the symbol of the spirit, as red as of the heart. I think I never saw blue to satisfy me before. Some of these clouds threw shadows of many shaded purple upon the green sea, and from one of the shadows so dark and so far out upon the glooming horizon that it looked like an island arose as from a pier a wondrous structure of dim fairy colors, a multitude of rainbow ends side by side that would have spanned the heavens with a gorgeous arch but failed from the very grandeur of the idea and grew up only a few degrees against the clouded west i stood rapt the two falconers were at some distance before me walking arm in arm they stood and gazed likewise it was as if god had said to the heavens and the earth and the cord of the seven colours comfort ye comfort ye my people and i said to my soul let the tempest rave in the world let sorrow wail like a sea-bird in the midst thereof and let thy heart respond to her shivering cry but the vault of heaven encloses the tempest and the shrieking bird and the echoing heart and the son of god's countenance can with one glance from above change the wildest winter day into the summer evening compact of poets dreams my companions were walking up over the hill I could see that Falconer was earnestly speaking in his father's ear. The old man's head was bent towards the earth. I kept away. They made a turn from home. I still followed at a distance. The evening began to grow dark. The autumn wind met us again, colder, stronger, yet more laden with the odors of death and the frosts of the coming winter. But it no longer blew as from the charnel house of the past. It blew from the stars through the chinks of the unopened door on the other side of the sepulchre. It was a wind of the worlds, not a wind of the leaves. It told of the march of the spheres and the rest of the throne of God. We were going on into the universe, home to the house of our Father, mighty adventure, sacred repose. And as I followed the pair, one great star throbbed and radiated over my head. End chapter 17
Chapter Eighteen of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Eighteen. Three Generations. The next week I went back to my work, leaving the father and son alone together. Before I left, I could see plainly enough that the bonds were being drawn closer between them. A whole month passed before they returned to London. The winter then had set in with unusual severity. But it seemed to bring only health to the two men. When I saw Andrew next, there was certainly a marked change upon him. Light had banished the haziness from his eye, and his step was a good deal firmer. I can hardly speak of more than the physical improvement, for I saw very little of him now. Still, I did think I could perceive more of judgment in his face, as if he sometimes weighed things in his mind. But it was plain that Robert continued very careful not to let him a moment out of his knowledge. He busied him with the various sights of London, for Andrew, although he knew all its miseries well, had never yet been inside Westminster Abbey. If he could only trust him enough to get him something to do. But what was he fit for? To try him, he proposed once that he should write some account of what he had seen and learned in his wanderings, but the evident distress with which he shrunk from the proposal was grateful to the eyes and heart of his son. It was almost the end of the year when a letter arrived from John Lammy, informing Robert that his grandmother had caught a violent cold, and that although the special symptoms had disappeared, it was evident her strength was sinking fast, and that she would not recover. He read the letter to his father. "'We must go and see her, Robert, my boy,' said Andrew. It was the first time that he had shown the smallest desire to visit her. Falconer rose with glad heart and proceeded at once to make arrangements for their journey. It was a cold, powdery afternoon in January, with the snow thick on the ground, save where the little winds had blown the crown of the street bare before Mrs. Falconer's house. A post-chaise with four horses swept wearily round the corner and pulled up at her door. Betty opened it and revealed an old withered face, very sorrowful and yet expectant. Falconer's feeling, I dare not, Andrew's I cannot attempt to describe, as they stepped from the chaise and entered. Betty led the way without a word into the little parlour. Robert went next with long, quiet strides, and Andrew followed with grey, bowed head. Granny was not in her chair. The doors which during the day concealed the bed in which she slept were open, and there lay the aged woman with her eyes closed. The room was as it had always been, only there seemed a filmy shadow in it that had not been there before. "'She's Dean, sir,' whispered Betty. "'Ay, is she. Ah, oh, hon. Robert took his father's hand and led him towards the bed. They drew nigh softly and bent over the withered, but not even yet very wrinkled face. The smooth, white, soft hands lay on the sheet, which was folded back over her bosom. She was asleep, or rather she slumbered. But the soul of the child began to grow in the withered heart of the old man as he regarded his older mother, and as it grew it forced the tears to his eyes and the word to his lips. Mother, he said, and her eyelids rose at once. He stooped to kiss her, with the tears rolling down his face. The light of heaven broke and flashed from her aged countenance. She lifted her weak hands, took his head, and held it to her bosom. Eh, the bonny grey head, she said, and burst into a passion of weeping. She had kept some tears for the last. Now she would spend all that her griefs had left her. But there came a pause in her sobs, though not in her weeping, and then she spoke. I knew it all the time, O oh Lord, I knew it all the time. He's come home, my Andrew, my Andrew. I'm as happy as a bairn, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. And she burst again into sobs and entered paradise in radiant weeping. Her hands sank away from his head, and when her son gazed in her face, he saw that she was dead. She had never looked at Robert. The two men turned towards each other. Robert put out his arms. His father laid his head on his bosom and went on weeping. Robert held him to his heart. When shall a man dare to say that God has done all he can? End chapter 18
Book Three, Chapter Nineteen of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Nineteen, The Whole Story. The men laid their mother's body with those of the generations that had gone before her beneath the long grass in their country churchyard near Rotherden. A dreary place, one accustomed to trim cemeteries and sentimental wreaths, would call it. To Falconer's mind, so friendly to the forsaken dust, because it lapped it in sweet oblivion. They returned to the dreary house, and after a simple meal such as both had used to partake of in their boyhood, they sat by the fire. Andrew in his mother's chair, Robert in the same chair in which he had learned his salust and written his versions. Andrew sat for a while gazing into the fire, and Robert sat watching his face, where in the last few months a little feeble fatherhood had begun to dawn. It was their father that Granny used to sit every day, sometimes looking in the fire for hours, thinking about you, I know, Robert said at length. Andrew stirred uneasily in his chair. How do you know that? he asked. If there was one thing I could be sure of, it was when Granny was thinking about you, father. Who wouldn't have known it, father, when her lips were pressed together as if she had some dreadful pain to bear, and her eyes were looking away through the fire, so far away, and I would speak to her three times before she would answer? She lived only to think about God and you, father. God and you came very close together in her mind. Since ever I can remember almost, the thought of you was just the one thing in this house. Then Robert began at the beginning of his memory, and told his father all that he could remember. When he came to speak about his solitary musings in the garret, he said, and long before he reached this part he had relapsed into his mother tongue, "'Come and look at the place, father. I want to see it again myself.' He rose. His father yielded and followed him. Robert got a candle in the kitchen, and the two big men climbed the little narrow stair and stood in the little sky of the house, where the heads almost touched the ceiling. "'I sat upon the floor there,' said Robert, "'and thought and thought what I would do to get ye, father, and what I would do with ye when I had gotten ye. I would great whiles cause other laddies had a father, and I had none. And there's where I found Mamma's box with the letter in it. Her own picker. Granny gave me that one of you, and there's where I used to kneel doing and pray to God. And he's heard my prayers and Granny's prayers, and here ye are with me at last. Instead of thinking about ye, I have your own self. Come, father, I want to say a word of thanks to God for hearing my prayer. He took the old man's hand, led him to the bedside, and kneeled with him there. My reader can hardly avoid thinking it was a poor, sad triumph that Robert had after all. How the dreams of the boy had dwindled in settling down into the reality. He had his father, it was true, but what a father! and how little he had him. But this was not the end, and Robert always believed that the end must be the greater in proportion to the distance it was removed, to give time for its true fulfillment. And when he prayed aloud beside his father, I doubt not that his thanksgiving and his hope were equal. The prayer over, he took his father's hand and led him down again to the little parlor, and they took their seats again by the fire, and Robert began again and again, and went on with his story, not omitting the parts belonging to Mary St. John and Eric Erickson. When he came to tell how he had encountered him in the deserted factory, "'Look here, father, here's the mark of the cut,' he said, parting the thick hair on the top of his head. His father hid his face in his hands. It was not muckle of a blow that ye give to me, father, he went on, but I fell against the grate, and that was what did it, and I never tellt anybody, na even Miss St. John, who plastered it up who I had gotten it, and I did not mean to say anything about it, but I wanted to tell you a queer dream, such a queer dream it guard me dream this same night. As he told the dream, his father suddenly grew attentive, and before he had finished looked almost scared, but he said nothing. When he came to relate his grandmother's behavior after having discovered that the papers relating to the factory were gone, he hid his face in his hands once more. He told him how Granny had mourned and wept over him, from the time when he heard her praying aloud as he crept through her room at night to their last talk together after Dr. Anderson's death. 
He set forth as he could in the simplest language the agony of her soul over her lost son. He told him then about Ericson and Dr. Anderson, and how good they had been to him, at last of Dr. Anderson's request that he would do something for him in India. "'Will you go on with me, father?' he asked. "'I'll never leave you again, Robert, my boy,' he answered. "'I have been a bad man and a bad father, and now I give myself up to you to make the best of me ye can. I dare not leave you, Robert.' pray to god to take care of ye father he'll do anything for ye if you'll only let him i will robert i was myself dreadful miserable for a while robert resumed for i could not see or hear god at all but god heard me and let me ken that he was there and that all was right i was just like when a barney wakens up and cries oot thinking it's alone and through the murk comes the word of the mother of it, saying, I'm here, crater, do not great. And I came to believe that he would make you a good man at last. Oh, father, it's been my dream walking and sleeping to have you back to me and granny and mamma and the father of us all, and Jesus Christ that's done anything for us. And knew ye mount pray to God, father, ye will pray to God to hold the grip of ye. Will not ye, father? I will, I will, Robert. But I've been an awful sinner. I believe I was the death of your mother, laddie. Some fount of memory was open, some tide of old tenderness gushed up in his heart. At some window of the past, the face of his dead wife looked in. The old man broke into a great cry and sobbed and wept bitterly. Robert said no more, but wept with him. Henceforward, the father clung to his son like a child. The heart of Falconer turned to his father in heaven with speechless thanksgiving. The ideal of his dream was beginning to dawn, and his life was newborn. It did not take Robert long to arrange his grandmother's little affairs. He had already made up his mind about her house and furniture. He rang the bell one morning for Betty. "'Have ye any cellar laid up, Betty?' "'Aye, I have fifteen pound in the savings bank.' "'And what do you think of doing?' I'll get a bit roomy and take in washin'. Well, I'll tell you what I would like you to do. You know Mistress Elshender. Find that, and a very decent body she is. Well, if you like, you can hold this hoose and all that's in it, just as it is till the day of your death, and you'll I keep it in order and the gale room ready for me at any time I may happen to come in upon ye in want of a night's quarters. But I would like ye, if ye have nae objections, to take Mistress Elshender to bide with ye. She's turning some frail new, and I'm under a great obligation to her, Sandy, ye know. Ay, well, that. He learned ye to fiddle, Robert. I humbly beg your pardon, sir, Mr. Robert. Nae offence, Betty, I assure you. Ye have been I good to me, and I thank ye heartily. Betty could not stand this. Her apron went up to her eyes. "'Eh, sir,' she sobbed, "'ye was I a good lad. "'Except when I spake of muckle-drum, Betty.' "'She laughed and sobbed together. "'Weel, ye'll take Mistress Elshender in, will not ye? "'I'll do that, sir, and I'll try to do my best with her. "'She can help ye, you know, with your washing and sitch like. "'She's a hard-working woman, sir. "'She would do that wheel. And when you're in any want of cellar, just write to me, and if anything should happen to me, you know, write to Mr. Gordon, a friend of mine. There's his address in London. Eh, sir, but ye are kind. God bless you for all. She could bear no more and left the room crying. Everything settled at Rothed, and he returned to Bodyfall. The most welcome greeting he had ever received in his life lay in the shine of his father's eyes when he entered the room where he sat with Miss Lammy. The next day they left for London. End chapter 19book 3 chapter 20 of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald Chapter 20 The Vanishing They came to see me the very evening of their arrival. As to Andrew's progress, there could be no longer any doubt. All that was necessary for conviction on the point was to have seen him before and to see him now. 
the very grasp of his hand was changed. But not yet would Robert leave him alone. It will naturally occur to my reader that his goodness was not much yet. It was not. It may have been greater than we could be sure of, though. But if any one object that such a conversion, even if it were perfected, was poor inasmuch as the man's free will was intromitted with, I answer, the development of the free will was the one object. Hitherto it was not free. I ask the man who says so, where would your free will have been if at some period of your life you could have had everything you wanted? If he says it is nobler in a man to do with less help, I answer, Andrew was not noble was he therefore to be forsaken the prodigal was not left without the help of the swine and their husks at once to keep him alive and disgust him with the life is the less help a man has from god the better according to you the grandest thing of all would be for a man sunk in the absolute abysses of sensuality all at once to resolve to be pure as the empyrean and be so without help from god or man but is the thing possible as well might a hyena say, I will be a man and become one. That would be to create. Andrew must be kept from the evil long enough to let him at least see the good before he was let alone. But when would we be let alone? For a man to be fit to be let alone is for a man not to need God, but to be able to live without him. Our hearts cry out, to have God is to live. We want God. Without him no life of ours is worth living. We are not then even human, for that is but the lower form of the divine. We are immortal, eternal. Fill us, O Father, with thyself. Then only all is well. More. I heartily believe, though I cannot understand the boundaries of will and inspiration, that what God will do for us at last is infinitely beyond any greatness we could gain, even if we could will ourselves from the lowest we could be into the highest we can imagine. It is essential divine life we want, and there is grand truth, however incomplete or perverted, in the aspiration of the Brahmin. He is wrong, but he wants something right. If the man had the power in his pollution to will himself into the right without God, the fact that he was in that pollution with such power must damn him there forever. And if God must help ere a man can be saved, can the help of man go too far towards the same end? Let God solve the mystery, for he made it. One thing is sure, we are his, and he will do his part, which is no part but the all in all. If man could do what in his wildest self-worship he can imagine, the grand result would be that he would be his own god, which is the hell of hells. For some time I had to give Falconer what aid I could in being with his father while he arranged matters in prospect of their voyage to India. Sometimes he took him with him when he went amongst his people, as he called the poor he visited sometimes when he wanted to go alone i was to take him to miss st john who would play and sing as i had never heard any one play or sing before andrew on such occasions carried his flute with him and the result of the two was something exquisite how miss st john did lay herself out to please the old man and pleased he was i think her kindness did more than anything else to make him feel like a gentleman again and in his condition that was much at length falconer would sometimes leave him with miss st john till he or i should go for him he knew she could keep him safe he knew that she would keep him if necessary one evening i went to see falconer i found him alone it was one of these occasions i am very glad you have come gordon he said i was wanting to see you i have got things nearly ready now next month or at latest the one after we shall sail and I have some business with you which had better be arranged at once. No one knows what is going to happen. The man who believes the least in chance knows as little as the man who believes in it the most. My will is in the hands of Dobson. I have left you everything. I was dumb. Have you any objection? he said a little anxiously. Am I able to fulfill the conditions? I faltered i have burdened you with no conditions he returned i don't believe in conditions i know your heart and mine now i trust you perfectly i am unworthy of it that is for me to judge will you have no trustees not one what do you want me to do with your property you know well enough keep it going the right way 
I will always think what you would like. No, do not. Think what is right, and where there is no right or wrong plain in itself, then think what is best. You may see good reason to change some of my plans. You may be wrong, but you must do what you see right. Not what I see or might see right. But there is no need to talk so seriously about it, I said. You will manage it yourself for many years yet. Make me your steward, if you like, during your absence. I will not object to that. You do not object to the other, I hope. No. Then so let it be. The other, of course. I have, being a lawyer myself, taken good care not to trust myself only with the arranging of these matters. I think you will find them all right. But supposing you should not return, you have compelled me to make this supposition. Of course, go on. What am I to do with the money in the prospect of following you? Ah, that is the one point on which I want a word, although I do not think it is necessary. I want to entail the property. How? By word of mouth, he answered, laughing. You must look out for a right man, as I have done, get him to know your ways and ideas, and if you find him worthy, that is, a grand, wide word, our Lord gave it to his disciples, leave it all to him in the same way I have left it to you, trusting to the spirit of truth that is in him, the spirit of God. You can copy my will as far as it will apply, for you may have, one way or another, lost the half of it by that time but by word of mouth you must make the same condition with him as I have made with you, that is, with regard to his leaving it, and the conditions on which he leaves it, adding the words, that it may descend thus in perpetuum, and he must do the same. He broke into a quiet laugh. I knew well enough what he meant, but he added, that means, of course, for as long as there is any. Are you sure you are doing right, Falconer? I said. Quite. It is better to endow one man who will work as the father works than a hundred charities. But it is time. I went to fetch my father. Will you go with me? This was all that passed between us on the subject, save that on our way he told me to move to his rooms and occupy them until he returned. My papers, he added, I commit to your discretion. On our way back from Queen Square, he joked and talked merrily. Andrew joined in. Robert showed himself delighted with every attempt at gaiety or wit that andrew made when we reached the house something that had occurred on the way made him turn to martin chuzzlewit and he read mrs gamp's best to our great enjoyment i went down with the two to southampton to see them on board the steamer i stayed with them there until she sailed it was a lovely morning in the end of april when at last i bade them farewell on the quarter-deck my heart was full i took his hand and kissed it he put his arms round me and laid his cheek to mine. I was strong to bear the parting. The great iron steamer went down in the middle of the Atlantic, and I have not yet seen my friend again. The End End Chapter 20 End Robert Falconer by George MacDonald